Previously, we discussed the first two steps of stage three of the glycolytic pathway. So in this lecture, I'd like to finish our discussion on stage three. So we're going to discuss step three, step four, and step five of stage three. And this is the same thing as saying step eight, nine, and 10 of the overall glycolytic pathway. So before we discuss step three, let's remember what happened in steps one and two of stage three of glycolysis. So in those two steps, two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate are transformed into two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. And so the beginning point of step three is this 3-phosphoglycerate molecule. And so that's what we have shown on the board. Now, this is carbon one, carbon two, and carbon three. And what happens in this reaction is an enzyme known as phosphoglycerate mutase basically catalyzes the movement, the transfer of the phosphoryl group shown in blue from the third carbon onto this second carbon here. And so we go from 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate. Now we'll, we'll talk about why that happens in just a moment. So whenever you hear the word mutase, what that should basically tell you is you're dealing with some type of enzyme that catalyzes a reaction in which it moves some type of group from one point on the molecule to a different point on that molecule. And so in this particular case, the mutase is a phosphoglycerate mutase. It moves a phosphoryl group within this phosphoglycerate molecule. So in this step, an enzyme called phosphoglycerate mutase catalyzes the movement of a phosphoryl group from the third carbon on this 3-phosphoglycerate onto the second carbon of that same molecule. And so this is what we form. Now, this is the net overall reaction, but it's not actually this simple because we also have an important molecule involved that is present in catalytic amounts, in very small amounts. And this molecule is 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate or 2,3-BPG. Now, this is the same exact molecule that we discussed when we mentioned hemoglobin's ability to bind oxygen. So in that discussion, we mentioned that 2,3-BPG is actually an intermediate in the process of glycolysis. And 2,3-BPG can basically affect the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. Now, what exactly is the function of 2,3-BPG in this reaction? So we see that this reaction doesn't actually take place in a single step because it involves the presence of a catalytic amount of 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And what it does is it basically plays the role of maintaining, so keeping that catalytic histidine amino acid in its active phosphorylated form inside the active site of the phosphoglycerate mutase. So basically, if we look at the active site of this mutase, we'll see a catalytic residue, a histidine. And to actually be able to catalyze this reaction, that histidine has to be modified with the addition of a phosphoryl group. And to see what we mean, let's take a look at these two steps. So in step one, we basically have this enzyme and inside the active site of the enzyme, we have the histidine that has been modified by the addition of the phosphoryl group. And so in step one of this reaction, what happens is, this 3-phosphoglycerate moves into the active site and in step one, this molecule, the enzyme, transfers this phosphoryl group from the histidine of that enzyme onto the second position of this molecule. So essentially we attach this phosphoryl group onto carbon number two and we form the 2,3-bi or bis-phosphoglycerate. And so we form this enzyme that does not contain the modified histidine as well as the 2,3-BPG. Now, this 2,3-BPG is only present in very small amounts. Why? Well, because it then reacts with this same enzyme histidine complex in a slightly different reaction. So even though this reaction is possible, another reaction that can take place is the following. 
So in step two, we have that same enzyme histidine complex and that same 2,3-BPG, except now, instead of taking off that phosphoryl group from the second carbon, we take off that phosphoryl group from the third carbon. And so once we take off this phosphoryl group, this one here, we basically regenerate that enzyme histidine with the modified group co uh, complex and we also form the final product, the 2-phosphoglycerate. And if we sum up these two reactions, we see that everything will cancel except these two molecules. And so by summing up these two steps, we get back this net reaction. So we see that in the first step, a phosphoryl group is transferred from that modified histidine on that enzyme onto the 3-phosphoglycerate, so at the second carbon position to form the 2,3-BPG. And that 2,3-BPG doesn't exist for a very long period of time because it's not very stable. It has too much charge in close proximity. So if we place two phosphoryl groups in close proximity, that increases the energy of that molecule and that's why the 2,3-BPG is higher in energy than this molecule or this molecule. And so what that means is it's not going to exist for a very long time. It will either, uh, it will, it will either go back here and reform these reactants or, or follow this pathway and form these products. So that same histidine then removes the phosphoryl group from the third carbon forming that rearranged 2-phosphoglycerate molecule. And so that's how this step actually takes place. But the next question is, why does this step actually take place? What's the benefit of this step? Well, basically, the reason this step takes place is to make this molecule slightly more reactive. The question is, why would this molecule here be more reactive than this molecule here? Well, because in this case, this negative charge of negative 2 is farther away from this negative 1 charge. But in this case, these two negative charges are closer. And we know from physics, whenever we have two like charges that are closer, that will increase that electric repulsive force between these two points in space. And so that's why this will be slightly higher in energy and more reactive than this molecule. So we ultimately want to make the molecule more reactive in step 3. Now, let's move on to step four. Now, in step four, what we basically want to do is we want to increase the phosphoryl transfer potential of this molecule. And so we ultimately want to transform it into a molecule that will be able to better transfer a phosphoryl group onto an ADP molecule to form an ATP molecule and pyruvate in step five. So, the entire point of step four is to create a molecule with a greater phosphoryl transfer potential. So in this step number four, an enzyme called enolase converts the 2-phosphoglycerate that was formed in this step three into a phosphoenolpyruvate or PEP. So this is the reaction shown here. So we begin with this same molecule and now we basically label this H atom and this OH group. And we also label this bond here because what happens is we have a dehydration reaction that is catalyzed by the enolase and basically these two combine to form a water molecule and this bond breaks off and forms a pi bond between this carbon number two and this carbon number three. And so this is called an enolase because we form an enol. So if you remember back to organic chemistry, this is in fact an enol and we call it phosphoenolpyruvate. So what this dehydration reaction does, and we call it dehydration because the water molecule is lost, what this dehydration reaction does is increases the phosphoryl transfer potential of this molecule. So this molecule has a lower ability to give off phosphoryl groups than this molecule here. And so the phosphoenolpyruvate is much more likely to donate one of its phosphoryl groups onto that ADP molecule because ultimately in the final step, step 10 of glycolysis, step five of stage three, we want to form ATP molecules. So in the next step, this is the reaction that takes place. 
We take this phosphoenyl pyruvate, also known as PEP, so PEP. This is the molecule here. And so now we're going to basically label this phosphoryl group here. And in the presence of ADP, this molecule here is very high in energy. Now, one other thing I didn't mention is, if you go back to organic chemistry and you compare the stability of ketones and enol molecules, we know that ketones exist in equilibrium with enols, but the ketones are much, much, much more stable than those enols. So the problem with this molecule is, it's actually trapped in its enol state. So this molecule wants to transform into that more stable ketone, but it can transform because this oxygen is missing an H atom. If we somehow replace the phosphoryl group here with an H atom, then it will be able to transform spontaneously into the more stable ketone form. In fact, that's exactly what will happen in this reaction. So this reaction takes place because this molecule has a very high phosphoryl transfer potential, even higher than ATP, and so in the presence of ADP, this phosphoryl group will be transferred onto that ADP and in the presence of an H plus ion, this will bind onto this oxygen. And so we form this pyruvate molecule in the enol form as well as an ATP. And remember what I said a moment ago. If, a, if an enol has the ability to transform into the ketone form, it will because that ketone form is thermodynamically more stable, lower in energy. And so what will happen here is once we form the pyruvate in the enol form and the ATP, this pyruvate will spontaneously and quickly convert into its ketone form. And so ultimately, this is the molecule that we're going to form. Now, because we have two of these molecules, three phosphoglycerates going into this pathway, we ultimately produce two ATP molecules. So we see that in stage three, we produce a total of four ATP molecules. So in step one and two, we produce two ATP molecules, and in this step, we produce two. And so two and two gives us four. And because we used up two in stage one, we have a net amount of two ATP molecules produced when we break down a single glucose molecule. So in the last step of glycolysis, step five of stage three or step 10 of glycolysis, we see that pyruvate kinase, this enzyme, catalyzes the phosphoryl transfer from the high phosphoryl transfer potential phosphoenyl pyruvate molecule onto the ADP. And in the presence of H+, we form the enol form of this pyruvate. And then it spontaneously breaks down into the more stable ketone form. So these are the three last steps of the process of glycolysis.